Now we know that to solve a linear system with constant coefficients, we need to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that matrix A, and then we can write out the solution in terms of exponentials. But as you know, even with a real matrix A, we might get complex eigenvalues and complex eigenvectors. So do we need to find a completely different formula in that case? And the answer is actually no, we can use the exact same result, which might be a little surprising. So that means we need to make sense of exponentials of complex numbers, and the source for figuring that out is called Euler's identity. Euler's identity says that e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i times sine theta. Here I'm thinking of theta as being real. Now, the modulus squared of any complex number is the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. So in that case, this is just equal to 1. So e to the i theta always has a unit modulus or a unit magnitude. More specifically, cosine theta, sine theta, the real and imaginary parts, are the coordinates of a point at the angle theta on the circle of radius 1, what we call the unit circle. So if we put the origin at the middle, and we have a circle of radius 1, then a point on that circle has angle theta from the real axis, positive real axis. That means that the point is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta, which is e to the i theta in Euler's formula. If we put an r out in front, where r is a positive real number, well, applying Euler's identity again, we get r cosine theta plus i r sine theta. And these are what we recognize as x and y when we do polar coordinates. So in fact, the term on the left here we can consider to be the polar form of a complex number. You specify r and theta to get the complex number. And then that converts to the xy, or rectangular, or Cartesian form of that number. The connection, again, is just Euler's formula. In this polar form, r would be the modulus of z, or the magnitude of z, and theta is what we call the argument, or depending on the context, we might call it the phase of z. Polar form makes multiplication very simple. These are still exponential functions, so we can add the exponents together. Division, very similar. The real parts divide, or I'm sorry, the magnitudes divide, and then you subtract off the angle of the denominator. So really, when you interpret these formulas geometrically, what they tell you is that in the complex plane, multiplication and division are really just the combination of a scaling and a rotation. Right? You're changing the magnitude and you're changing the angle. Now we're ready to talk about e to the lambda t, where lambda might be a complex eigenvalue. So we'll write lambda in terms of its real and imaginary parts. And then these, this is still an exponential function, even with complex arguments. We can break it up into the product of two exponentials. The first part is purely real, and the second part is e to the imaginary, so that's just Euler's formula. Or we could just think of the front as 
the magnitude and the second term as the direction or the angle theta. So the real part A of the eigenvalue tells you about the growth or the decay of the magnitude or the amplitude. And omega, the imaginary part of lambda, tells you about the frequency of oscillation around the unit circle. Here I'm going to demonstrate complex exponential functions by plotting them. Uh, I'll start with a case where we had an eigenvalue with zero real part and imaginary part equal to 1. So in other words, this is going to be the function e to the i t. Let me go ahead and start it. So what will happen is that time will go along this axis. As it does, you'll trace out a curve according to the real and imaginary parts of the function e to the i t. So if you just look at the bottom plane, you'll get the real part as a function of time. The back plane will give you the imaginary as a function of time. And then this plane here is just real and imaginary. So this will be the complex plane parameterized by time. And you can see, since we have e to the 0t with the real part, the magnitude or the modulus doesn't change in time. So this time we just go around and around the unit circle. Watch down here, you just get a cosine uh, function for the real part. You get a sine function for the imaginary part. That's Euler's identity. And we get this perfect helix in the path through time. Now let me do another case with a small positive real part. So now the magnitude will evolve like e to the 0 0.02 times t, so it'll grow. Meanwhile, the imaginary part is larger, so it'll go around faster. So it goes around, but it doesn't quite meet back up because the magnitude is growing, and so we get this outward spiral. And on the individual real and imaginary parts, you get cosine or sine, but with a growing amplitude. All right, one more case. Now I'll choose a negative real part. So that means the magnitude will be like e to the minus 0.1t. So it'll decay. And then omega is a bit smaller than we've started with, so it'll go around more slowly with a lower frequency. So now it's moving around slowly relative to the change in the magnitude, and so the spiral, in addition to being decaying instead of growing, the spiral is a lot less tight this time. These should be perfectly uniform angular velocities, but the screen capture is occasionally slowing it down. That's why you see it hesitate sometimes. When we have complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors to go with them, here I'm writing everything in terms of real and imaginary parts, we know that we can use exponentials that happen to be complex, but we can use them just as we were doing before combination of two exponential solutions, and that is the general solution. There might be other parts if there were more eigenvalues. Now, if the initial conditions of the problem are real, then this formula actually is also real valued. If the imaginary part starts at zero, it stays at zero. But it's not quite obvious that it's real. It doesn't really look real because of those complex numbers. 
sometimes we want a solution that also looks real without ambiguity. And the trick is we can just take one of these complex exponentials and multiply it out to get real and imaginary parts. So we use Euler's formula here. And then we're just going to multiply these out, as we normally would do multiplication, and applying the fact that i squared equals negative 1. So we get two terms that are real. We get the product of the cosine with u, and we get the product of the sine with z times i squared, so that becomes negative 1. And then we get two imaginary terms. We get the sine times u and the cosine times z. And now the real and imaginary parts of this expression, which is the same exponential we started with, but they themselves are independent real solutions of the problem. So we can take two complex exponentials with conjugate eigenvalues, or we can take these two real things that were the parts of one of those complex exponentials. Either way, we get equivalent but different looking expressions for the general solution. So if you express the eigenvalues and eigenvectors with real and imaginary parts, then you could plug them in here as a formula and get this alternative expression. But I'll also show you in the example to come up, you may not have to do things by memorization. So here's a real 2 by 2 system, and the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are complex. So we could just identify everything in our formulas. We could say, oh, well, a must be 1, omega must be 1, and here's the thing that defines the u and the z, and just plug all those things into the formula. If you don't want to memorize a formula or look it up, well, it's easy enough to just say, look, I'm going to write out that exponential solution. and I'm going to find its real and imaginary parts using Euler's formula and a bit of algebra. We get two contributions to the real part. and two contributions to the imaginary part. Then the real part of that thing and the imaginary part of that thing are our two independent solutions, so we can just take a linear combination of those. Either way of going about it is fine. Frankly, from a mathematical point of view, the complex solution is fine. This is just more for appearance's sake.